In this video, we'll be discussing beta-lactam antibiotics. So beta-lactam is actually a specific chemical ring that looks like this. And it's actually the cornerstone of all of the penicillin and penicillin derivative antibiotics. So this beta-lactam ring is incredibly important for antibacterial activity. So looking at chemical structures specifically, you can see with the moxicillin, which is part of the penicillin drug class, we have that beta-lactam ring. And similarly, with cephalexin, which is one of the cephalosporin drug classes, we also have the beta-lactam ring. The difference between the two is the ring right next to it. So in the case on the left, the penicillin, we have the beta-lactam ring, which kind of looks like a garage, and right next to it, we have a house. And in contrast with the cephalosporin, we still have a garage, but we've upgraded a little bit, and now we have a basement which is the bottom half of the ring here. So you can actually look at the chemical structure, and if you see a basement in the house, then you know it's a cephalosporin. And if you don't have a basement, then you know it's a penicillin drug class. Before we get into how the beta-lactam works, we first have to understand the drug target that we're looking at, which is the cell wall of a bacteria, also known as the peptidoglycan. So the peptidoglycan is a polymer of two different molecules called NAM and NAC. And these are polymers where they're repeated continuously. And right now, before they become connected, you can see that they're just different layers. So it's like a, a number of different layers of paper on top of each other. There's an enzyme that all bacteria have called penicillin binding protein. And this PBP flies around and it actually creates crosslinks between different layers of paper. And that crosslinking is incredibly important for the structure and stability of the peptidoglycan or the cell wall. So now we've taken our sheets of paper on top of each other, and by forming that crosslink with the penicillin binding protein, we've turned it into a brick wall instead of a series of pieces of paper on top of each other. The way that beta lactams work is they bind to the penicillin binding protein. So now, just like two puzzle pieces that fit together, when the penicillin binding protein tries to create the crosslink, it can't do it because the beta-lactam is bound to the enzyme. Because we've inactivated that penicillin binding protein, there's no crosslink. No crosslink means that the peptidoglycan, instead of being a brick wall, is a bunch of sheets of paper, and that instability will cause cell death because the peptidoglycan won't hold the contents of the cell in. The first drug class for beta-lactams are the penicillins. So we already briefly mentioned amoxicillin, the brand name is amoxyl. And then a uh, cousin to that is amoxicillin with clavulanate, and the brand name of this is augmentin. So you can see the only difference between amoxyl and augmentin is the presence of clavulanate. They're dosed the same, and they're dosed based on the amoxicillin component. Amoxyl or amoxicillin is typically used for upper respiratory tract infections. So that would be ear infections and strep throat. And then augmentin, because of the clavulanate, also treats respiratory tract infections, but also can treat pneumonia, bacterial sinusitis, bite wounds, and even urinary tract infections. So we gain a lot of spectrum in terms of in a bacterial spectrum when we add on that clavulanate. And we'll talk about what that does in just a second. One of the ways that bacteria can fight against the antibiotics that we give is by creating something called a beta-lactamase. So beta-lactamase, you can kind of think of it like a Pac-Man. What that beta-lactamase does is that it targets our beta-lactam ring. So remember, with our penicillins, it's the house with the garage. And what the beta-lactamase does is it targets the, the bottom part of our garage. And right now, our beta-lactam ring is active, but when that beta-lactamase comes in, it's going to break off the bottom part of our garage, and now it has inactivated our beta-lactam ring. We no longer have the bond that was right here, the enzyme that the bacteria made called beta-lactamase broke the bond and made it so that our, in this case, amoxicillin didn't work at all. We already talked about how augmentin is amoxicillin with clavulanate. What happens is when that bacteria tries to target the garage part of amoxicillin and it creates all of those beta-lactamases, the clavulanate is the way that we can get around that. So the clavulanate will fly in and occupy those beta-lactamases while our amoxicillin is able to get into the bacterial cell and cause cell death. 
We call that clavulanate a suicide inhibitor because it is kind of like a kamikaze pilot against those beta-lactamases. So it flies in and basically takes out those beta-lactamases so that our main antibiotic, the amoxicillin, is able to work. The other drug class for beta-lactams that is fairly common in prescription form are cephalosporins. The three that I want to focus on in this video are cephalexin, the brand name is Keflex, has to be taken four times a day, cefuroxime or ceftin twice a day, and then ceftin or on the ceph, that can be taken twice a day or even daily. So as we already mentioned, the chemical structure of these cephalosporins is a house with a basement with the garage attached. Now, the spectrum of these varies pretty widely, but in general, these cephalosporins are used for upper respiratory tract infections, just like amoxicillin, urinary tract infections, just like augmentin, skin infections, bronchitis, and pneumonia, and that's really only for the latter two, cefuroxime and ceftonir. And one of the reasons for the difference in spectrum is that there's different generations of cephalosporins. And in this case, cephalexin or keflex is a first generation cephalosporin, cefuroxime or ceftin, second generation, and then finally omnicef or ceftonir is a third generation cephalosporin. Now not always, but typically as we go down in spectrum, we get better gram negative coverage, meaning that we're able to kill gram negative bacteria better as we get to a lower generation. So unlike penicillins, our cephalosporins actually do not use suicide inhibitors in order to evade beta-lactamase. So what do they do instead? Well, bacteria don't know if we're giving a cephalosporin or a penicillin. So from the bacterial point of view, it's still going to produce beta-lactamase. And that beta-lactamase is still going to target the bottom of our garage. But in this case, when that beta-lactamase swings in, it's unable to open up the ring. The reason why beta-lactamase isn't able to open up the ring is that we have increased ring stability because of the basement of our house here. With cephalosporins, they have better stability against beta-lactamase because their ring structure is more stable, whereas with penicillins, they have to rely on other mechanisms in order to evade beta-lactamase. Some common adverse effects of beta-lactams are going to be nausea and diarrhea, which is fairly common with any antibiotic and then also skin rash, and again, fairly common with any antibiotic. Some rare adverse effects of our beta-lactams are what are called super infections. So Clostridium difficile diarrhea, this is an infectious form of diarrhea where we kill off a lot of the good bacteria in the gut, leaving only Clostridium difficile in the gut, and it can cause really watery diarrhea, which can be infectious. We can see oral thrush, uh, so this is actually a fungal infection on the tongue uh, caused by a fungus called candida. We call this candidiasis. And it's overgrowth of this fungus in the mouth because we kill some of the good bacteria in the mouth. And then also yeast infections. So again, if we kill too much of the bacteria in the vagina, we can be left with yeast that can overgrow and cause a yeast infection. Really with all of our antibiotics, there's a few pretty simple counseling points. If a patient's symptoms don't improve within a few days, they should call their prescriber. It's possible that they, the antibiotic that they were given isn't active against the infection that they have, and maybe they need a different prescription. Also, another important counseling point is that even if a patient starts to feel better, they should really complete the entirety of their antibiotic course. And the reason here is that we don't want to promote bacterial resistance by giving only a partial course of antibiotic therapy. So to summarize, we talked about two penicillin-based antibiotics, amoxicillin, or amoxil, and then amoxicillin with clavulanate, which was a suicide inhibitor, brand name was Augmentin, and that gave us a broader spectrum of activity. For our cephalosporins, our first generation cephalosporin was cephalexin, or keflex, cefuroxime, or ceftin was a second generation cephalosporin, then finally ceftonir, or omnicef, was a third generation cephalosporin, and as we get to a later generation, we have better gram-negative coverage.